And Father, we thank you that you welcome us into your presence this morning. The Lord, as we have worshipped, Father, you take each one of us as we come. We thank you, Lord, that you have already captivated our hearts to bring us into relationship with you. But we thank you, Lord, there is so much more that you desire to teach us, that you desire to take us into a deeper understanding of exactly who you are. And that's what, Lord, we desire to receive this morning. We want more of you, Lord. As we humbly come before our holy God, to know, Father, that we have done nothing to deserve your grace over our lives. Jesus has done everything, and nothing can be added to that. You simply invite us to come, to receive, to be willing to surrender our spirit into your spirit, that you will touch and transform and change us to become like you. So, Lord, as we surrender in the truth of your word this morning, we ask, Lord, that you will touch yet again and reveal the intimacy that we need right now. Have your way with us, Lord. Holy Spirit, just come and be the voice. Come and be the spoken word. Come and be that love, grace, and that truth that touches your people this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a look at this morning at the subject of grace. And the more you try to explore this subject in the Bible, you begin to understand just how powerful, how intimate and how diverse it is. We could spend hours studying this topic and yet maybe still not grasp that intimacy that God wants us to understand. But I encourage each and every one of us, as we do share something of it this morning, just to, as I said, it's such a massive subject. But for what we will touch on this morning, I pray it will minister into your spirit in Jesus' name. The Jesus who sacrificed his life on the cross for us, John 3.16, a very familiar verse in the Christian faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world. We are all part of that world. We are all created by him. But Jesus died on the cross that absolutely every creative being in him would have the opportunity to know him, to receive him, and to live a life in all the fullness of him. And yet we know, sadly, there are very few that are drawn to that narrow road with Jesus because the wider road of the world's temptation holds them in bondage and they are blinded to the truth. But I praise God, we're here in this place this morning, and we are not blinded to that truth as we have received Jesus Christ for ourselves. When we talk about God's saving grace, Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5 says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Because of his great love for each and every one of us, that though we live in a fallen world and we're so messed up by it, our God who is rich in mercy. Mercy is God's help to learn a be better way. 
His mercy covers us, that he's willing to teach us a better way. He has made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. In other words, whilst we are in our sin, whilst we are in our mistakes, whilst we are in the mess of life, that Jesus knew over 2,000 years ago that we would be alive for such a time as this and be living in all of that mess even now, he chose to go to the cross and died on our behalf by his grace on that cross. We have been saved. That there's a way out of the frailty of the flesh when we understand who Jesus is and his love and his grace over our lives to draw us into relationship with him because he wants to show us a better way. He died to open up that way, even though he knows how messed up we are. The mistakes that we've made, the bondage we've got trapped by, the deception we've been living in, the failures and the mistakes of all of our life have already been covered by Jesus on that cross to set us free. In Titus chapter 2, 11 and 12, it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Jesus died on the cross his grace was demonstrated, and he offers salvation to all people. Now, praise God, everybody in this room has received Jesus in our salvation grace, that we've turned our hearts to follow his way. As somebody has prayed probably for many years for us and spoken the truth of the gospel to us, God has captivated our hearts in that salvation favor, that salvation grace, and called each one of us to himself. And we've all said, yes, thank you, Jesus. But there are many out there who will never say yes. And yet Jesus died for them too. They just don't understand what he has done and what they are able to receive. And that's why we need to keep sharing the truth of Jesus, sharing the truth of the salvation invitation that is there for everybody to be offered and their free will choice to receive. But to continue in that verse, it says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, ungodly lives in this present age. So, yes, God has saved us through faith in Jesus, who died on the cross to set us free. But it is in that grace that he then teaches us how to say no to the ways of the world, how to say no to the ungodliness, how to come away from the worldly passions that trap us. Every lie and deception of the enemy that holds us in bondage, the word says, he teaches us through salvation grace how to say no to all of that and learn how to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. The gospel is alive today. The Holy Spirit is alive today. The Holy Spirit is ministering today. The Holy Spirit is setting people free today. The invitation of God goes out today to learn and to understand, as we are taught, how to live a far better way before God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Notice, all have sinned. There's not one of us can sit in this room today full of pride and say, I am perfect, because we're not. And I'm sorry to burst your bubble if you came through that door this morning believing that you, you are. All have sinned. We all fall short of that glory of God. But by receiving Jesus into our lives, we are all justified freely. There's no measure of us just being justified. There's no measure of us being set free. It's a completion 
of being justified in Christ. It's the completion of being set free in Jesus. It's available to us all. It doesn't give more to one person than to the other. However, each one person will receive the limitation of what they're believing for. So God doesn't limit how much grace we can have, but it's up to us how much grace we choose to live in. So we are all justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We can only receive it because Jesus died to release it over us. We are only redeemed because of who Jesus is. There is no other way to freedom in God except through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in Ephesians 2, we're told, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. We are saved not because we decided to be saved. We are saved not because it has anything to do with us. It is grace, through grace, that we have been saved through faith. We have all heard the gospel. Somebody has ministered to us about the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Our hearts have been captivated. Our spirit has risen up and said, yes, I believe that gospel's truth, and I choose to follow Jesus. When we pray that salvation prayer, when we first step into relationship with Jesus, do we know what we've really done? Do we know what we really have the open door into? No. But we're being captivated. The Holy Spirit touches something in us and says that we need him. And we all say yes, but then we begin the journey to follow him. We need to be taught who Jesus is. We need to be taught what the way of Jesus is. We need to understand what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're all going to spend the rest of our lives on this journey of learning. Because as much as we may grasp even the truth today to understand more of the grace that has been lavished over us, there is still more. We can only touch on a tiny facet of what it really, really means. There is always more. But we need to get captivated in our spirit and a hunger and a desire and a passion and a determination to want to follow Jesus in all the fullness of who he is to receive all that he wants to release over us. How he wants to transform and change us. So it's for it is by grace we have been saved through our faith to choose to follow him. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Jesus did not do that death on the cross because we asked him to. Jesus died on that cross because God the Father caused him to. Even Jesus himself says that the Jews did not take his life. They were complicit in killing him in the practical act that caused his death. They crucified him. But only because Jesus was willing to go to the cross to allow them to do that in the will of the Father. He gave up his life in the hands of God the Father to die in our place, the perfect sacrificial Lamb, the Son of God, sacrifice that as we believe by faith in him and receive that grace over our lives, we are set free in him. So there's nothing to do with us and our asking, will you do this for me, Jesus? Jesus said a long time ago, I've done it for you, every person in this room. I choose to go to the cross today because in 2023, everybody sitting in the South End branch of Barmagillion Church that believes in me, I did this for you. It is a gift of God. We cannot earn it by work so that we cannot boast that we've done anything to deserve it. We don't. Grace is God's unmerited favor. We do not deserve what Jesus has done for us. Father God sacrificed his son on the cross that we might live in all the fullness of him. We do not deserve what God decided to do for us. But God decided that we are worth it. 
because it's got nothing to do with us and what we deserve. It's all about God's heart of love and grace over our lives that as his children, he wants us in relationship with him. And he gives us a way out of where we are at to journey on a journey of faith before him. And there's nothing that we can do, no matter how hard you work, doing what you think you are doing unto the Lord. You cannot earn your right to eternity in heaven. It's about the surrender of your heart in a sacrifice of your life unto him, that as he laid his life down for us, we are willing to lay our life down for, for him. Therefore, we cannot boast that we've done anything to deserve it. We cannot boast that, well, if I work really hard, I'm really going to get extra points to enter into eternity in heaven in a far greater way. No, we can't. All he says is simply believe and follow Jesus. Believe and be baptized and follow Jesus. So his saving grace is all because of who he is, not because of who we are. But we are privileged. We are privileged to walk in what God has given the freedom to release over our lives. We have a freedom to walk in it by choice. But grace is often misunderstood. And there is many a false gospel going around the world at this moment in time. There is many a line of deception going through the false gospel that simply says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and your life will be absolutely fine. You won't have any trials and tribulations. You won't have any difficulties. You won't have any pain. And you can do whatever you want, however you want, when you want, why you want. And when you realize that God is on your conscience, you can say sorry to God and he will forgive you. And you will be set free in Jesus' name. But you can actually live the, your life the way that you want to. That is the biggest lying deception of the enemy. We have just read he has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of what we've done, but because of his purposes and grace to be fulfilled. We've all sinned and fallen short, but it's by his grace we've been saved through faith. We have to understand the responsibility that we have to respond to what Jesus has done for us, that we receive it and take it on board to realize, actually, if we say yes to following Jesus, we are going to change. We have to be willing to change. We have to surrender our lives into him as a sacrifice to him, as he has done for us, that we are willing to change. And we can't change just by our will. We cannot make ourselves better. We need the Holy Spirit in us, through faith in Jesus, to help us. And there's different parts of our life where we get Holy Spirit conviction on a certain behavior that we may have been doing all of our life and never seen wrong in it. And suddenly the Holy Spirit convicts us that he doesn't want us to do that now. And everybody's journey is unique and individual. So what God calls one person to sacrifice and give up will be different to what somebody else is called to give up, depending on the calling and the anointing and positioning that we take in life, the purpose for which we are called in God. But if we don't grasp that that grace is such a love and tender heart of God over our lives as an invitation to come into true relationship with him, that with his help, we can be transformed and changed. And there is a purpose in that transformation change that we are raised up in the anointings and giftings and purpose for what our lives are created to be in him. Then we're always going to live in the ways of the flesh. And we've got to cast out this false gospel. You know, we all have to walk through this earth and we all know that we will never be truly free of sin. The Bible tells us, as we've read, that we are sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory. But with God's gracious move into our lives, there is an empowerment through the love that was displayed by Christ on the cross and through the power of the Holy Spirit, which allows us to progressively escape from sin. He gives us a way out for every temptation that is brought across our path. The grace of God was never meant to be a license for us to abuse God's character, his laws or his people. 
It's an empowerment to experience the change from glory to glory as we continue to walk with him. When we are walking in the truth of the spirit, when we take the word of God into our heart, as we get an understanding in our mind, you know, many people will read the word of God and they get captivated in the mind understanding. But it has to go 18 inches down from your mind to your heart to convince your heart that what you just understood, God is speaking to us and he's actually telling us there's a different way to live. And he's asking us, are we willing to live out his way? So it has to go from an understanding of what God is asking and what we read in his word or what we're taught. And we have to allow it to go down 18 inches to our heart connectability that our heart responds to what we now know, and in our free will choice, we choose to do something about it. We have to take it into our minds, we have to take it into our hearts, that we will not abuse God's grace, we won't take it for granted as an excuse that we remain in the sin that we've been living in. But in actual fact, when we understand the truth of grace, we will experience freedom, not just from sin's consequence, but even from the, the presence of sin in our life. In other words, it just doesn't cancel out when we mess up and we repent. We actually learn not to do the mistake to begin with. When we are being transformed and changed in Christ, there is a change in our character. There's a change in our heart attitude. There's a change in our demeanor. How do we live our lives? Do the people around us that we communicate with every single day know that we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ? What causes us to stand out? What causes us that the world would look at us and know there is something different about us because we follow Jesus? How much do we radiate Jesus? How much are we allowing the Holy Spirit to change us? In Galatians chapter 5, it talks about the fruits of the Spirit from verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is the transformation change. That is the very nature of God. They are all the fruits of the Spirit that Jesus already has demonstrated to us through the Bible. We have something that we should be aiming for to become Christ-like. But no one of us can say, today, I choose to have joy, and we live in joy forevermore. Because we know that that joy will only come as we live in the leading of the Holy Spirit. That joy will only come when we have a peace in our hearts because of the leading of the Holy Spirit. So we can't just pick those facets of the fruit of the Spirit and decide that's what we're going to be. If I was to say to you from now on, right, we're all going to have self-control. Because I've talked about it, because I've pointed you to the scripture about it, from now on, you will always have self-control. Self Wouldn't that be brilliant if we could just decide today, I will always have self-control? But it doesn't work like that, does it? And God knows it doesn't work like that. We can hear the word, we understand the truth of what it means, but then we have to come into a surrender of our hearts to a holy God to say, Lord, help me to have self-control. And when we have self-control, you know, there's, I, always, I was taught years ago, there was a reason why love is the first fruit of the Spirit and self-control is the last one. They're like the bookends to every other fruit of the Spirit. That if we walk in love and we have self-control, we are more likely to, to, likely to develop the fruits of joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness and gentleness. Because we are learning how to love in the way that Jesus loves. We're learning how to live in the way that Jesus demonstrates. 
So these characteristics come through the more we know who Jesus is, the more we know the truth of the word, and the more we apply it to our lives. But what we have to remember is in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's handiwork. We're a work in progress. We're all being transformed and changed, going from glory to glory, but we're all on my unique individual journey. I'm not called to walk out Verity's journey, and she's not called to walk out mine. Whatever's brought us together at this place in time to stand in Jesus, we've both got a completely different history of learning with Jesus. But what we bring in the different facets of who we are in Jesus is a complement to the body of Christ. And it's the same for every single one of us. We are all God's handiwork. And we are created for good works. There is something that God wants us all to do. Something that he prepared in advance for us to do. It's already ahead of us, waiting for us to step into. But before we can get there to step into it, to do what God has prepared in advance for us to do, he needs to change us to have the character of Christ to be able to step into it. Therefore, he will strip certain things away from our life. You know, one of the things that I was shown many, many years ago by God was I had a Holy Spirit conviction about watching TV. Everybody watches TV. Nobody sees any problem with watching TV. It's a part of everyday life in the world. TV is there and everybody watches it. And everybody's talking about the latest program, the latest dramas, the latest films. And yet the Holy Spirit comes upon me and basically says, I don't want you to watch that. And people around me couldn't understand why I don't watch TV, why I haven't even got a TV. My family come over to visit, my grandchildren come and stay. They know I don't have TV. But it's a call over my life that God called me into. Only the Holy Spirit can convict somebody, do not watch TV. There's a reason God didn't want me to watch TV, because what he was showing me was when I'm watching TV, I am watching other people's sin. Every drama that we watch, every soap that is on TV, we are watching life in all its fullness of the world's sin being demonstrated in different storylines. And as we watch it, it feeds our spirit. What we see with our eyes feeds our imagination. What we hear with our ears, we feed on And we tend to emulate what we watch, what we see, because we get so numbed to the the sin that has been committed on the screen. Our conscience get numbed by it, that we get trapped and, and we live in the ways of the world because we're being fed in the spirit. This is okay. We've got to put a watch on what we see. We've got to put a guard over our eye gate. We've got to put a guard over our ear gate. That what we see and what we hear has got to resonate in our spirit in a conscience in Christ. And if we don't, we feed on the ways of the world and get numbed to be like everybody else in the world. Our conscience in Christ gets weakened, weakened and we don't walk in the fruits of the spirit. But it is Holy Spirit conviction for a purpose. There was a reason why God had to show me years ago, I don't want you to do this anymore. I want you to feed on what I show you. I will lead you what to read in the Bible. I will give you discernment on what you listen to in respect of preaching. That's why social media is so dangerous for a Christian who says, I am a Christian, but I'm walking my faith out on my own, listening on social media. I don't have to go to church. That's a deception of the enemy, because you're listening to who? What is their foundation? What does their ministry stand on? What do they truly believe? How are they interpreting the Bible? How do you counterbalance what you believe the Bible says if you cannot have conversations with other Christians who may have discernment in the spirit to pick up? Actually, that isn't true. So you lean on your own understanding, in your own learning, in your own world, and the enemy comes, and you can only be one degree off course, and the longer you're one degree off course, the wider that gap is away from Jesus in truth, and you are way off course. So we need to put a guard over what we are listening to, what we are watching, who are we listening to. 
I've often said, in, even when I'm preaching, don't take what I say as gospel. Go home and read these scriptures. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you them and to reveal the truth of them for yourself. And if you believe I'm in error, come back to me to tell me. Let's have a conversation. Let's pray about it. Let's discern God's truth together. We are not to walk out our journey of faith on our own. God calls us to be relational in the body of Christ. He does not call us to be separated as islands. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. See, do your best. We have to have a spirit that is surrendered into. We do the best that we can in the natural, but we need God's Holy Spirit conscience in us to help us overcome what is natural and frail, that we have truth and strength and freedom in Christ. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Our conscience in God should mean that we have the approval of God, that we do not have to live in guilt, condemnation and shame because we're learning the truth of the word, we're understanding the truth of the word, we're valuing the truth of the word, we're surrendering to the truth of the word and we're learning how to apply the truth of the word in the best way that we can with Holy Spirit help. We cannot do it on our own. And that's why it says in John 14, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. We need Holy Spirit help to get there. We cannot journey this on our own. He is our helper. He is the discernment. He is the strength that we need. He is the discipline in self-control that we need. And the commitment that we make to him allows the Holy Spirit to set us free in the freedom that we need. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, it says, Sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. What a brilliant scripture. Who is our master? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit? Sin does not have to be our master when we live under grace in Jesus. There is a way out and a transformation change that we have to be willing to step into to surrender by his grace. That is the invitation of God. But we have to be careful. Because when we surrender to receive his grace, when we learn how to walk in his grace, when we're being transformed and changed in his grace, if we relax in that discipline about grace, we can easily fall into that wrong gospel that says, well, I can do what I want, when I want, why I want, how I want, because if I do it and then say sorry, I will be forgiven. No, true repentance is turning away from and learning never to do that wrong act again. And that's why it says in Romans chapter 6 from verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? In other words, do we keep doing what we want to do and keep repenting so we just receive grace upon grace upon grace? Verse 2 says, by no means. In other words, no. Once we know the difference of living in God's grace or living in the freedom of the world, we have to come out of the world to stand in his grace, to know his grace, to live in it. So we cannot abuse the grace by just doing what we want to, just because we know Jesus died on the cross to set us free. So it says, by no means, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Holy Spirit conviction said to me years ago, don't watch television. If I, if I today decide I'm going to watch television, what am I doing? I'm rebelling against the very guidance that God has given me. 
God took me out of watching TV to fill my heart with his spirit and his truth through the word of God, that what I feed on is what I become. And the more I feed on Jesus, the more like him I become and the more equipped I am and presented for purpose before him. So I can't decide today, oh, today I'm just going to do it, Lord. It's okay just this once, Lord. No, because my spirit has been tainted wrongly by it. So those who have died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were by baptized into his death? He died for us and we are called to die to self. We are called to die to self, to not carry on living in the ways of the world. We are called to lay that down because we are becoming Christ-like. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We are called to be Christ-like, to believe in him, to be baptized in him, lay our lives down sacrificially for him, just as he has done for us, and learn to live in his grace through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we are transformed and changed in him, and every fruit of the Spirit begins to grow in us. The grace that Jesus lavished over our lives is a grace that we do not deserve. When we understand that and we are broken in our spirit understanding to know that intimacy of who Jesus really is and what he did for each one of us, even though he knows we're not perfect, it's an incredible love grace over our lives but we don't deserve it. An acronym for grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. It cost Jesus to go to the cross, to give his life for you and for me, that today, we can live in the grace that we do not deserve. God wanted to lavish his riches over our life. There's so much that God wants to release into our lives, over our lives and through our lives for our good and for his glory, his riches that are beyond measure. But the only reason we can receive God's riches is because Jesus paid the price. It's at Christ's expense. He gave his life. It cost his life for us to live in all the fullness of him. But we have to take it to heart to realize the sacrifice that has been made and to understand that in every facet of life that we are living through right now, every encounter and difficulty a circumstance we may be going through right now. I want to remind you that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16, 17 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Paul was so sure-footed in his faith in Jesus, that Jesus told him that his grace was sufficient for all that Paul endured. And he shared it with us, that we can take that scripture to heart today, that whatever we are going through, his grace is sufficient for each and every one of us because his power is made perfect in our weakness. When we hit circumstances and difficulties that we don't know what to do. That is the point that if we cast our cares on Jesus and include him in the journey, that is the point that we have the exchange in the spirit where God says, you may not be able to, but I can. And as you surrender to me in all your frailty and your weakness, I release my grace and my strengthening over you. My grace is sufficient for you. He is the everything and the all that we need 
He has such a passion and determination over our lives that his power is demonstrated in the weakness and the frailty of who we are in this lifetime. But are we willing to go to him and lay everything before him to allow his grace to manifest into our lives, that we are transformed and changed and we are set free in the circumstance by his grace as he orders our steps in him. And when we start to get captivated by Jesus to see the power of God working in our lives, we all have testimony where we have seen the hands of God manifest in power. That's what we should be boasting about. I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. We have to admit that we've messed up. We have to admit that we're going through difficult circumstances. But we share, but this is who my God is. We can all say, I have been through this, but this is who my God is, and this is where I am despite my circumstances. But we have to be willing to come to receive the grace that Jesus died on the cross to release over our lives. We have to remember that it's all about him, not about us. There is an empowerment when we fully understand grace to realize the cost of Jesus sacrificing his life to us. When we understand that, when we believe it, when we take it to heart personally, that Jesus did that for each and every one of us. Do you know, if there was only one person in this room today that believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, if there was only one person through what Jesus did on that cross would say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus would have still gone to the cross for the one. Jesus went to the cross for you. He went to the cross for you. He went to the cross for me. He desires that there are many, but he knows those who will respond. And as we respond in the Lord Jesus Christ, as we surrender into the grace that he has lavished without measure over our life, God is a generous God. He just keeps on giving. We need to remember it comes at a price that we live in the fullness of his grace, God's riches lavished over us at Christ's expense, that Jesus died to set each one of us free. Will we today choose to receive that grace, understand that love and grace over our lives and surrender our hearts, that we give him permission by his grace, to touch and transform us, that we become all that he has created us to be. God is faithful. He will do it. But he needs each and every one of us to come into that place of surrender, to sacrifice our lives for him, that we might live in all the fullness of him. In Jesus' name, amen.